Well, time dependence is an important uh, physical case for micro world, that's atomic world, because you know, it's the electromagnetic interactions which play a crucial role. Atoms are bind, bound together through electric forces, etc., and in order to excite them, etc., etc., you need to insert them in external electromagnetic fields, and electromagnetic fields are obviously oscillating waves. Therefore, time dependence is a crucial problem for the atomic world. Therefore, we have to develop a rigorous formalism to discuss these time-dependent potentials. And eventually, we will go to perturbation theory, because rigorously, most often than not, we cannot solve these problems, as I have indicated in the earlier case. We cannot solve them exactly, so we have to develop perturbation theories. So we are going to base our discussion on the previous discussions, that is the interaction picture description. For that reason, I will write the full Hamiltonian in the form of H0 plus Vt. There is a known part, time independent known part, H0, whose eigenvalue problem is known. We define it through this label, this equation. Notice that I don't put zeros on En or N because that's the only time independent part. Therefore, there is no need for complicating the notation further. So these are the energy eigenvalue problems of the time independent part. And this Vt is turned on at a given time, and we would like to investigate the effect of this Vt on the uh, spectrum of the original H0. So for that reason, we imagine the problem to be formulated in the following manner. Here's, there is a time t0, there's a time axis. Before this, earlier than that, there is the physics is described by h0. Suppose you prepare your system to be in an eigenstate or a superposition of eigenstates of the h0. And at t equals t0, you turn on the perturbation at this level. So after the t0, the physics is described by this new Hamiltonian. So there is an additional v in the game now. It is suddenly turned on at t equals t0. And what is the effect of this on the initial state, which was here? So we say the initial state in here, if you want, you can call it as such, psi initial, just immediately before, it is known to be in, in a state like that. And what is the effect of the Vt on that? In order to formulate it, we can specify, we can take this initial state to be, for instance, and let's consider simple, a simple case. Of course, it's actually the simplest case, really. Not a simple case, but the simplest of all cases, that you can choose this initial state to be in one of the eigenstates of this group. And then you follow its evolution as a result of the Vt. In order to understand this, suppose the consider the special well to motivate consider the evolution problem
without V. You may say, we already know this, we know it, but let me, for the formulation of the problem, I need to reconsider this. What I mean is the following. Here is the psi i initial state. At, then we, under the effect of H0 only, how does it evolve? It will evolve as such, as we have seen before. If it is at t equals t0, for instance, it will evolve like that, right? Because we have seen previously that in the presence of, uh, in the absence of time independent, time dependent potentials, we are in the Schrodinger picture, and the full Hamiltonian is h0, which is time independent, and time evolution operator is this. You take the initial state and act on it by that, and you get the evolved state on its own. For instance, if we uh, formulate this one, uh, put, put it there, formulate this initial state, either you can take it, for instance, either as a given single energy eigenstate or a superposition in the most general case, right? Cn, n. You are free to consider the simplest or the most general one, initial one. Any arbitrary state can be expanded in terms of a com complete orthonormal basis. That is the so-called quantum postulate. So if this is the one, it will evolve into e to the minus i over h bar e i t minus t zero times i. And if it is this one, it will evolve into a more general case, e to the minus i over h bar e n t minus t zero. And as simple as that, beautiful, isn't it? That would be the way they evolve. Because you just move that operator into this expansion, and then it comes, and as the E ends are the eigenstates of the H0, it picks that phase. So it, it is very much like the initial one, but there is these uh, pure phases appearing. Fine. So I'm trying to go carefully to, oh, by the way, if you want to simplify the notation, we can take T0 to be zero, so that this additional T0 parameter, may, we, we, may, we may lose it. Choose T0 is equal to zero. You start your chronometer at that particular point to simplify the notation. As this is the more general version, let's focus, my, let's focus our attention from this point on, on this general version. The initial state was an arbitrary one before turning on the perturbation. And if we let it alone on its own under the H0, because there's already a Hamiltonian H0 time independent that governs the physics, it's going to evolve in time as such. Erase the T0 if you choose that specific case. So the question is, can we include V in a, how do, this question is a little more involved. What is the, what is the simplest way of incorporating the effect of V. Following this line of reasoning, repeating myself, if this was the initial one moved into that if this, this is taken for granted, then 
if I go to H0 plus V now, let me add it, use a different color if I can't find the chalk. So what is the sort of cheapest, easiest way of incorporating that? Well, Mr. Dirac and other people have said, why don't we just give this a time dependence? What kind of time? I don't know. It's an unknown. It became a dynamical variable now instead of a constant. Just to retain this as it is. So this is the Dirac answer. So isn't that nice that we say, if we give an additional time dependence to be determined eventually, either through exact way rigorous equations or perturbation theory, then that could be a good starting point. And that's the starting point of ours. Well, perhaps at this level, it may be necessary to give, oh, by the way, if you let b goes to 0, c and t goes to the ordinary constant, c ends, and we recover the original case. So what is the meaning of these c and t's now? They are, they are dynamical, right? They, they must have a meaning. Meaning of c and t's. Well, in order to really answer that question, what we have to do is look at this, that evolved state in time. Let's call it the evolved state. This was the initial state, psi at 0. This is the evolved one. And ask the question, as, what is the probability of finding that final evolved state in one of the eigenvalue, eigenstates of the original H0 again? That's the question. And that is this is the answer of the question, right? If I want what is the probability of finding this evolved final state in one of the eigenstates and that eigenstate I label by n. And that is the amplitude. And probability would be obtained by taking the mod square of it. So if I let me compute that from there. Obviously, I have to change the dummy index to m, right? This n is given a specific one. Uh, so I change that dummy e notation to cmt e to the minus i over h bar emt n m m is the original psi of t summed over m the dummy this is the free these are the dummy this is orthonormal to start with delta n m i can carry out the summation M, then I get the following. N psi of t is equal to C n t times e to the minus i over h bar e n t. So up to this phase, e to the minus i over h bar e n t, C n t's have the meaning that the meaning of the probability density of finding the evolved state in the nth eigenstate of the original time independent h0. Although saying it, the sentence is lengthy, the meaning is simple, right? It is really one of the basic statements of the quantum theory. Thus, the CNTs have really a very profound the dynamical meaning. If we f have a formalism, which determines those for us, it essentially contains all the answers to the physical questions, right? Because then directly I will know after the evolution what is the probability of finding it one of the original eigenvalues. If you sum over all those, of course, you get the full state, the psi t. So our ultimate purpose is now to determine the c. 
By the way, although this amplitude itself contains this sort of not that nice looking phase, if I take the, not the amplitude but the probability, that phase disappears, right? Obviously. So it's not that complicated. C and T squared. And probably that's what you need, really, not the amplitude itself, but the, this expression. Therefore, more or less, everything is contained in the CNT. By the way, if this is obviously in the Schrodinger or default picture that we have been carrying this all out. What if I go to the interaction picture? How do we go to the interaction picture? Well, obviously, we go to the interaction picture through this again. Let's remember the discussion we had in the previous hour. It is minus i over h, i over h bar plus, of course. H0 t, psi of t, Schrodinger. Without the indices, it, it, everything was in the Schrodinger. So if I take the Schrodinger picture discussion there, and if I go to the interaction picture, what do I have for that time evolved state? Take that, this one. Psi t interaction is this e to the i over h bar a zero t times that, that is n times c n t well, this is sort of a circular argument. Some of you will think that it's circular. It's not. So it costs us an extra two minutes only, right? This was, the sh this was in the Schrodinger. We don't write the sub-index. It is this one that I have written in here. And it is this operator I have to act to convert in it into the interaction picture. This operator comes in and x on that gives you e to the plus i over h bar e and t, which kills this and gives you c and t. And isn't that nice? So the c and t already here is, if I solve it, if I solve the c and t, I get the following n times psi of t in the interaction picture without any phase even. So the interaction, going to interaction picture saves you from that phase, additional phase. So it is without the phase directly, the amplitude itself directly is the probability of finding the evolved state expressed in the interaction picture in one of the eigenstates of the original Hamiltonian H0. So these are the meanings of C's. Once we understand everything about the C's, let's see how to determine them. OK, let's try to determine, construct an equation which enables us to compute them. As I said, it turned out that they are the crucial things. We, we know the CNT, we know everything about the physical system under the influence of the external time-dependent potential. So as the interaction picture formalism is simpler, obviously we have to go to the interaction picture. And the equation in the interaction picture is what? I h bar d by dt psi of t interaction is v i t psi of t interaction nice well that's the equation we have obtained right so what do we do what we do is we project this equation say on the nth eigenvector of the h0 these are eigenvectors of the time-independent H0. They are time-independent, therefore, jumps over the 
time derivative comes here. So left hand side becomes i over h bar d by dt n psi t interaction. How nice, you see? I already managed to have the cn's appearing in the left hand side of this equation. What about the right hand side? Right hand side is n vi t psi t interaction. Well, this is C and T. That's nice. Already, the left-hand side is done. It is a first-degree differential equation involving the C and Ts. But right-hand side doesn't look that comfortable yet. In order to really handle it, what we do is insert an identity in here. Oh, as usually, we, that's what we do usually, right? M, M. What is an identity? Say, a completeness relation of the eigenvectors of the H0 is a very nice identity. Therefore, if I substitute that in, what do I get in the right-hand side? Left-hand side is finished, so I'm not doing anything further on the left-hand side. In the right-hand side, I have the M summation. N, V, I, T, M, and M, Psi, T. And that's very good, because we, have, we see that CMs appeared in the right hand side as well. The only thing left for us to further clean up is the interaction picture expression of the VI. And that is what? This is e to the i over h bar h0t times vt times e to the minus i over h bar h0t. That's the definition of the V interaction picture operators in terms of the Schrodinger picture, well, the default picture operators. So this H0 acting on the left-hand side gives you En. That acting to the right-hand side gives you Em. Therefore, the right-hand side finally becomes E to the I over H bar En minus Em T times n v t m n v t m times c m t okay now uh, we are more or less there it is so nice that we could get this equation so quickly really it's really an ingenious method, obviously. So the, 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 I can write now the full equation. I h bar d by dt c m t is equal to sum over m. Let's define the frequency associated with the uh, gaps of, between the energy levels. E n minus E m divided by h bar. We define it as omega n m. So omega n m is defined as 1 over h bar. That's the definition. So E n minus E m. Then this becomes e to the i omega n m v n m t times c m t. A very nice equation indeed. If you think of the C coefficients as members of a column matrix, C1, T, C2, C2, T, okay. depending on the degrees of freedom of the problem, the simplest one is a two-state problem. Imagine that you have a spin up, spin one half particle in an external magnetic field. It has only two states, up and down. Therefore, writing that equation for that case is easy. You write a double uh, a two spinner for the C1 and C2. Right hand side now becomes in that. This is the matrix representation of the V in that space. V and M times if there's a phase, but that's a square matrix. 
So if it is a dim dimension is the capital N, N state problem, capital N, and this is a matrix N by N. Uh, here's again a column matrix, N cross one. And this is a column, that's the square matrix times a column, again a column, so it's consistent. You, so imagine that now you have, want to have consistency, left-hand side is a column, right-hand side is a matrix times a column, which is a column, so you have everything in order, right? To check the consistency, that all the indices are in the proper order. So that equation is an equation which, an exact one, so depending on the uh, structure of the problem, then you can try to solve that problem exactly, and that is fine. Only for the two-state problem, sipping up, sipping down. Because usually solving such problems require that you diagonalize matrices, and we know that symbolically higher than two by two matrices, we cannot successfully diagonalize. If you go to three, state or four state or five state, already it's two by two, three by three, four by four, five by five matrices, etc. So you cannot solve them. Solving quadratic equation is easy, but solving cubic, quartic, or quintic equations are next to impossible. Even you try to solve a cubic equation, you see how sophisticated it is. Huh? Sometimes uh, if you look at the literature, it's impossible. Therefore, this equation can be solved exactly in the two-state case, and we will, I hopefully, perhaps myself, not Idris, I will present you that details of that uh, computation. For two-state problem, this equation can be solved exactly. And symbolically, exactly, that's what I mean. Or you can go to higher order problems and you can try to solve it exactly numerically using powerful computers. That's possible. That's not what I'm talking about. Exactly and analytically, okay. And for higher state problems, you need to resort to perturbation theory. So postponing the exact solution for the two-state problem to a later stage, we have to do it because it's a, one of the most fundamental problems, right? In physics, many technologies are based on it and quantum information theory is based on it. So therefore, two-state problem due to its very special nature and importance, we are going to spend some time on it. But now let me proceed to develop a time-dependent perturbation theory for all cases. Eventually, after we finish with that formulation, for instance, we may wish to use that formalism, perturbation theory, to solve this two-state problem perturbatively, of course, when the conditions are satisfied. If the external perturbation B is weak enough as compared to H0, then you can, of course, use the perturbation theory. As far as perturbation philosophy is concerned. There is no difference between time independent and time dependent ones. The only additional uh, complication is due to the time dependence of the extra term. Or else you have to split the full potential into two parts, known and large, additional and small, in a given basis. Then once these two conditions are satisfied, you can run the algorithm of perturbation theory. We will do that for the two state as well. If these conditions are satisfied, we will solve it perturbatively and compare against the exact solution. You say, no, of course not. You cannot compare an approximate solution against an exact one. 
So how do we compare whether these two things are consistent? Well, the way is the following. When we saw this exactly, and obviously there will be the, the potential, this additional potential Vt in it to any degree. It's large enough because we have solved it exactly. But if we identify a small parameter in that V and go to the limit that that V becomes small because of that smallness of that extra parameter, then you can find an approximate mathematically approximate form of that exact solution. That's pure mathematics. You have an exact solution, you go to a certain limit, and you find an approximate limit of it, put it aside. And then go to the same problem. Now, once the B is small, you can use the perturbation theory and find the perturbatively consistent solution, valid for that small V. And now you have two small V solutions. One is constructed from the perturbation theory directly. One is obtained indirectly from the exact solution going to the same regime. You can compare. You see that these are the philosophy. Please, please do not forget it. You have exact equation on one side, approximate equation on one side. You don't compare exact to approximate. You cannot. There is no way. You go from that exact to that small coupling limit, get that equivalent form, and then compare and try to identify whether there are any inconsistencies or not. OK. So once we understood that C equation is such, and C has the physical, it carries all the dynamical content related to the problem in hand. So how we develop a perturbation theory for that coefficient. Well, for this, we have to remember the meaning of the C and T we identified in there. And let's see whether we can use it for developing a quick perturbation theory. OK. C and T is N psi T i. That was the, the, it saved us from that additional ambiguity of the phase, right? In that case, there is no, there was a phase in the Schrodinger picture, there is no phase in the interaction picture. What is this? We can write this as ui t, take the initial time to be zero at the time that potential is psi i t zero. Nice, isn't it? Because it takes us to the t zero point in which the perturbation is turned on. Now, that. If it is, say, it was originally, this problem now is relevant for the discrete case I have been discussing. If you have a two state, you can take the initial state to be in a, a superposition of any of those two states, or you can even start with the simpler case, either from an up or down. You say that, let me, let me choose my initial state to be the ups, up spin state and turn on the potential and let's see whether it can make a transition to the down state and what is the period, what is the oscillations. So if I choose that initial one, t0 equals zero, sorry, because we are simplifying the notation, you don't need additional. If we choose that to be in one of the original eigenstates of the h0, then you, what you see is a beautiful one, right? C and t is this particular expectation value of the UI, how nice. That automatically offers itself in a, as a free gift to the perturbation theory. Why? Because I have the perturbation expansion of this. I have constructed it already. What was this? I, identity operator minus zero now. If I, chose, I have chosen the initial time T0 to be zero, T0 to T, VI, T prime plus minus I over H bar squared T dt prime 
dt double prime to t prime 0 to 0 vi t prime vi t prime vi t double prime etc right plus minus that is the expansion of this inside expression the time evolution operator in the interaction picture associated with the fact that time dependent potential is turned on at t0 equals 0 time and is this really a good perturbation theory vis-a-vis -vis the c yes because if you now write this, taking the expectation values, what do you get in the right-hand side? Delta ni, because i sandwich between n and i, they are complete orthonormal eigenstates eigen of the H0, so they are indeed orthonormal. So this delta ni minus i over h bar dt prime to t n vi t prime i plus minus i over h bar squared integral to t dt prime integral to t prime dt double prime n vi t prime vi t double prime i beautiful so I have indeed in the right hand side a perturbation expansion, right? The first term, zeroth order term obviously, doesn't contain any V. Second term contains a single V. First, third term contains a double two V. Indeed, the number of Vs is a counting criterion for the degree of the perturbation. So if I expand the left hand side accordingly, So if I expand the left-hand side, let's do that. Let me use a good notation for this. Yes. So I'm now expanding this left-hand side, Cn t, Cn0, Cn1, Cn2. That's the degree of the expansion. What is the bookkeeping mechanism of the degree? In the right hand side is the number of v's. No v, one v, two v, therefore the zeroth order should correspond to the no v case. And this the first order should correspond to one v case. So we already have the beautifully opened up the perturbation theory result. So CN0 is delta and i. Cn1 is minus i over h bar dt prime to t and 0. Now, that's, let me compute that. Let me write it and I will compute. n vi t prime i. So the meaning, particularly for the discrete uh, n state problems is relevant. This, the meaning of this is that we are considering the initial state to be in one of the specific eigenstates and we are asking the question of finding it in another, or perhaps even the same, survival, in another state other than, other than the initial one, but single eigenstate initial, single eigenstate final, and C coefficients are obviously the probability density of finding the final state to be in that N. So Cn2 is minus i over h bar squared dt prime to t, dt double prime to single t prime, and vi t prime, vi t double prime to i, and it goes on like that. So we have the beautiful perturbation expansion for the coefficients. So these are individual terms are the C's at given orders. The first one is the zeroth order. Second one is the first order. Third is the second order. But now the physical question is, 
When you compute those things, then when you have a feeling on the strength, on their strength, so you wish to express the C to the given order, to the given order. Then you can write C to zeroth order, to zeroth, Cn is Cn0, finished. To first order, Cn is Cn0 plus Cn1. But these are the physical expansions. You individual terms are computed. You have to complete the series, add them up to get the full expression to the desired order. So to the second order, Cn is Cn0 plus Cn1 and Cn2. That is, if you want the probability, not prob probability directly now, of finding the state in that particular nth eigen state, finding the evolved time dependent state in a particular nth eigen state, you take these and compute the absolute value. So these will have the following three expressions for the orders indicated. It's going to be either this or this or or this or to any order you like. I hope this is clear. Individual terms are to be summed up to give you the full C coefficient and to get the probability you have to take the full square. Fine. Now let me clean up these expressions and then we'll stop at that point. Particularly, most often than not, we'll, have the, we'll use the first order expression and we'll retain the series to first order. That's Cn0 plus Cn1. So immediate thing, immediate challenge is to clean up that expression. What do I mean? To clean up is to remember the form e to the i over h bar h0 t prime times v t prime minus i over h bar h0 t prime. Right, that's the expression of the v in the interaction picture. And you take this first factor, act on the left, take the right factor, act on the left and right, sorry. Then it picks the phases, ENs and EIs. Therefore, the first order term that, as I said, most relevant one because we will be using it very often. CN1 will be e to the minus i over h bar 0 to t dt prime. Then it's going to be e to the i over h bar en minus ei times t prime. But en minus ei divided by h bar is omega ni. So e to the i omega ni t prime vmm t prime. That is the beautiful expression. So you take your vt, part of the Hamiltonian, you compute this matrix representation in the energy eigenstate sector of the H0. Put it there and you multiply it that with the phases. These phases are a measure of the transition between the initial i and the final n state under consideration. What, again, let me repeat myself. You state, start with a given initial eigenstate, uh, which you call i, and you would like to see, find out the transition amplitude from that initial eigenstate i to another eigenstate n under the influence of that vt. It causes that transition. If there is no time-dependent potential vt, you cannot change the state. It if it starts at the i, it will keep staying in the eye with the phase. But 
in order to change a transition, cause a transition, you need a VT. Time dependent potentials do not commute with the H0, obviously it's going to move out of the initial state. That's an important physical and mathematical statement. So that's the simple CN1 expression, and let me try to finish in the remaining five minutes of that complicated looking second order term. What I have to do again, write the e to the i over h bar, h0 t prime, v t prime, e to the minus i over h bar, h0 t prime for this. And similarly, t double primes for there, but you say it's too complicated. How are you going to simplify and g generate phases like those? Oh, there's a way to do it. You insert here an identity. Which is one, right? Then it, you, you really relax because then this first factor and second factor picks the phases from N and M. And the second potential picks the phases from M and I and they move out of the expectation value. And what we get? What we get for that is the following now. CN2 is minus I over H bar squared. Integral to T dt prime. Integral to T prime Please pay attention to this time ordering. It's a beautiful mechanism, but complicates life if you don't see it. And there is also a summation in here. We can, I put in here, M. But perhaps I can move the, well, let's leave it here. Whether it's here or there doesn't matter because there's no time dependencies. So e to the i omega n i t prime times e to the i omega Sorry, NM, because there is NM coming from here. NM, MI, I inserted the complete sum. So A to the M, MIT double prime, VNM, T prime, VMI, T double prime. You see, it's more complicated than the first order of one, but how to handle it is easy. If you can, cannot remember the form, obviously you should not, because remembering such things require that you have to pump a lot of junk into your brains. You can construct it in two minutes, as you see how easy to construct. So that is the second expression, second order C coefficient. So if you are going through that order, you have to add, if n is different than i, then zeroth order term is zero. If you check whether you can make a transition from initial to a different final state, zeroth order goes away because delta n i is zero when n is different than i. Then you, that term is not there. You have to add the first order correction plus that second order correction, take the mod squared, and you get the probability of finding that initial state to make a transition to a different final state. I think it's a beautiful and e convenient point to stop. Next time we are going to move into special forms of potentials. The first one will be constant perturbation. Second one will be time period periodic, periodic potentials. And you will, let me not get into detail. You may think that calling a constant potential a time-dependent problem sounds paradoxical, I know. You'll see why there's no paradox and it's a beautifully consistent thing. So it's, that's it for today.